meet the biz. Uh, today we have a woman who is, I, I have to say breathtaking is the word that comes to mind at this moment. I mean, she, she has worked um, through Europe, Asia, America. She, she is a, an actress, a singer, a composer, a lyricist, uh, a director, a producer. She's a teacher. We are coming from New York today, and we have Anita Hollander. Oh, I love you. So exciting to be here. Oh my God, so exciting, so exciting. I, it's, uh, and it was such a blessing several years ago that you came to Performing Arts Studio West uh, and the Meet the Biz program uh, and put on a full show, your full show. It was great. I was so happy to be able to do it and for the perfect audience. And it was a show I'd been doing for, well, I've now been doing it for 26 years and that was just a couple of years ago. So um, to be able to do it for that group, for the group at Meet the Biz and then workshop a little afterwards. Right. Just fabulous. Uh, it really was. I mean, everybody was like, oh, when's she coming back? When's really? she come Well, you're back right now. You're here. <laughs> so you did you perform that same one at Carnegie Hall? Was it no? I performed um, uh, somebody else's work at Carnegie Hall. Jeremy Beck. Uh, he's also a singer songwriter. Uh, no, not uh, he's a songwriter and a musical writer, and uh, and he does classical as well as theater. And I was one of his theater singers, and that was very exciting. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, Carnegie Hall. And now you you performed at the Kennedy Center. Yes, many times. Um, I, I originated the, the title role of Greddy Goodtime, John Beluso play. Um, this was his first big production of it at the Kennedy Center. And since I had done a couple of readings for him, he, uh, everybody, it was great. Everybody was rooting for me to do that part. The interesting sad part was that after we had this triumphant run of it at the Kennedy Center, uh, a theater in New York decided they were going to do the New York premiere and they decided it was better to have a non-disabled actress play the title role who is disabled. And that was one of the moments in my life when I buried myself under my pillow and stayed in bed for a whole day because <laughs> That, you know, there's ups and downs in the showbiz. You go to the Kennedy Center yeah. one minute, and then the next minute when the show you just did is gonna be in New York, where you live, right up the road, and they decide that it's a, okay not to be authentic. And John Beluso was a disabled playwright. He was a groundbreaking disabled playwright. Right. So both of us shed a lot of tears about that decision. and because he was at the beginning of his career, his option was to pull the play, but how do you pull the plug on your first New York right. premiere? It was sort of like, you do, the, do it my way or you don't do it at all. And he said, uh, yeah. So the interesting thing, my life has always been yin and yang. Yeah. And interestingly enough, the yins and the yang seem to come very close together. Yeah. Um, sometimes I've had a really bad experience, two weeks later, the universe says, you've been through enough, here's a really good experience. In right. this way, it was a really good experience, and then they just shot me down the ground. <laughs> but I had to say to myself, Anita, you originated this role at the Kennedy Center, it was the best experience, yeah. forget it, you know? And then I got to do Still Standing, my solo show, Still Standing standing at the Kennedy Center as well. So uh, they've been wonderful. I love the people there. I, anyone who's worked there knows that it's like heaven to work there. My God, I would, next time you're performing there, I wanna come. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a ticket and say, I'm gonna go see Anita. It could happen, it could happen. It, it, it will happen, it will happen. Um, now, during that time, was that when you became really involved in the SAG after performers with disabilities or were you, no. you had been in that for a while? Yeah, I was dragged into this whole uh, thing when I became disabled 
um, actually, I be became disabled f at first in 1977. I had a brace on my leg. I still had my left leg. And, and uh, even then, I was starting to advocate because I was touring in Europe with the show and I had a brace. So I was already advocating for um, people with this, performers with disabilities. I was one of four people to be chosen to go to Lambda, four women to be going to Lambda. And I had the brace on my leg and they were like, oh, well, the Brits are so great. They said, Anna Calder Marshall, one of our most famous alumni, she had a withered leg. We love people with disabilities. It was like unbelievable. But mm -hmm. even there at the school, there were some faculty who weren't that enlightened and uh, they got fired because of something they, did in regards to me in a dance class. And all I did was speak about it saying, am I gonna be banished from this dance class? Cause I can't do heel, toe, toe, heel, toe, toe because I've got a brace on my And uh, they didn't like that she had done, she, she really made it very, um, this woman was very difficult and very cruel. And they knew her to be a cruel teacher anyways, but she got fired on this one. And so, as I say, coming back to the main point is that in 1978, I was already um, advocating. Then uh, after I lost my leg, I moved to New York shortly after, and it was just, it came to me and people said, would you come to this meeting? I went to the meeting. I realized that they needed me almost more than I needed them because I already had this experience and I never stopped working. I went back on stage four weeks after I lost my leg and opened a show. So I already had these experiences to talk about. Can, so, can, I, can I jump in there just for a second? How do you go through something like that? You lose your leg and then four weeks later you say, hey, the show must go on. Yeah, well, I was already in rehearsals I had a little warm up because my the brace was on my leg for five years before the tumor recurred and then it was time to amputate. So I had, I always say I had five years to prepare for the ultimate uh, loss, which would be the whole leg. It wasn't guaranteed that I would lose the leg, but when it became obvious that these tumors weren't going away and the cancer wasn't going to go away unless they amputate. So the five years prepared me. So that when I went into rehearsals, directing, choreographing, and it being in Jacques Brel is alive and well and living in Paris in Boston. The show has a long title, but it's uh, um, an amazing it's show. A fantastic show. And when I, t I took the job to direct it because the director would get paid, but the actors weren't getting paid. So I, well, I'll take the job that gets the pay, but I was in the show too. I was diagnosed after we had been rehearsing for a while um, I had the cast come around my dad, my bed, like Winston Churchill, whose birthday I was born on. And I had them stand around my bed and I said, okay, we're doing the show. I have to get my leg amputated, but in two weeks, uh, they say I can be, come back to rehearsals, like leave of absence every night from the hospital. I can come back to rehearsals. So you work on the music with the music director while I have my leg amputated for the next two weeks, then I will come to rehearsal in two weeks make sure that this thing is staged. I'll choreograph it. <laughs> like they go, how are you going to choreograph a show on one leg when you've never had one leg? I'm going, I'll do it anyway, because I was born in a trunk and I know how to do theater. So two weeks after the amputation, I went back to rehearsals for four hours a day. Um, I said, I, my painkiller lasted from seven to 11 PM. And we, uh, I, I staged the show on one leg and crutches because they couldn't make me an artificial leg that fast. You just yeah. can't get them that fast. Um, so, and the great thing about it is that I could show them what I wanted in the choreography and this cast knew what I was talking about. I was going, you know, if we do this and this and they were, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, it got blocked and, um, and we opened exactly four weeks, well, my amputation was March 12th and we opened April 15th, uh, so four weeks later. And they had a bucket and a pole underneath my long skirt. So I had an, a pre-artificial leg because again, it can't, you can't make a permanent one that fast after an right. amputation. So it's like a bucket and a pole and a, and a little uh, valve and a little foot at the bottom. But with a long skirt, nobody knew. They just knew I was using crutches. And I used crutches in the show and I went up and down stairs and I, I just, 
Here's the thing, David. Yeah, yeah. My life's been, I've been so lucky that every time something happens to me, I have a goal. Two weeks, four weeks, something's coming up. I don't have time to feel sorry for myself. I don't have time to worry about tomorrow. I have to get back to like the first time after my first cancer operation, I need to get back to school at Carnegie Mellon because I want to graduate with my class. So I can't sit around with the chemo and stuff like that. I can't sit around feeling sorry for myself, even though I had so many things going on with a skin graft and a, you know, a scar down my leg and everything. But it was like, I don't have time to worry about this. Right. Life is short. I may not live past 30. Who knows? I was 21 at the time and they weren't even sure that all of this was going to work. So it's I've been been really lucky. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it really hit me when you were talking about that, about the time, how time is, is the most valuable thing. And you could sit and either get into your head or, or do nothing or what you did. You just, okay, what's next? We gotta, we gotta live life. That's and really, that's, what you do. that's so, that's the biggest thing. And listen, right now, right now, that is a big deal. I'm not wasting a second of this what's so-called downtime, right. because this is the time that we always ask for. We ask for more time to do the things that are on our list, right. the great things to do if we are lucky to have a list. And I never go without a list. <laughs> I'm like, I thought it was like, really? Okay, now I can do this. But, you know, I've been reading books. I haven't had time to read books. I've been writing songs. I haven't had time to write some more songs. I've been... I have a list of things, what to do when there's nothing to do, you know? And not everybody I know has that. So there's been, I mean, I'm not against people taking a good long rest. Right. And you can sit on the couch and you can relax and, and refuel that way. But that's not really how I refuel. Mm. I, think I refuel by, I teach kids music and I see them on the screen and I have a children's choir and, that's what refuels me. Why, you know, because I don't want to wake up, you know, my usual eight o'clock anymore. I want to like, I want to sleep in, but then I don't really want to sleep in. Right. I want to walk out and, I, and there's only this many hours of sunlight. <laughs> Could be said that I'm a little bit driven. Well, uh, you know, and the way you describe that as well, this, this last part, what really it really shows that the biggest disability is most of the time right up here, if not all of the time. Because the mind can keep you from moving forward. It's true. It's, um, I mean, as I say to the kids, I go to a workshop in Boston every year with the Urban Improv, and I say to them, do you need a leg to sing? No. Do you need two legs to, to um, write a poem? <laughs> Do you need to? And they're like all going, no, no, no. So, you know, the only thing I've come up against where people think I need a leg is because someone else needs me to have two legs for mm. their comfort. Um, Isn't that, that's, that's so what's so great about the work that we've done all these years with uh, performers with disabilities yeah. is that 20 years ago, uh, walking into an audition on one leg would be the surefire way to waste your entire day <laughs> because you're not gonna, they're not even gonna consider you. But years have gone by, we've been fighting and fighting and struggling and fighting on both, you know, New York, uh, LA, Chicago, uh, Florida, Georgia. You're all, all over the place the country, with this. And all over the world in, in Europe and in Asia, fighting, fighting for this inclusion and this acceptance that you don't need to be non-disabled to have incredible talent and do things and because of that now i'll go to a, a tv audition and 
Gail, my wonderful agent, will say, oh, they said just come as you are which is one leg. You know, I have a gorgeous artificial leg and I wear it in part of my shows and then I don't wear it for part of the shows because I like, it's a gorgeous leg and it, it comes in handy when I'm doing a soft shoe, comes in handy when I'm doing a salsa, but it doesn't come in handy when I'm doing one leg Tai Chi when I'm singing a song doing Tai Chi at the same uh. time. That you need to, for me, being on one leg is better. Now, people would argue that Tai Chi also needs both legs, but there you go. You don't need it. But now, you know, and I just did FBI Most Wanted, and they liked me with, uh, without having my leg on. They said, no, no, be the landlady who happens to have one leg. Right. <laughs> this was mind-blowing because that never would have been said even five years ago, much less 10, 15, 20. 20 years ago or 30 years ago, 1980. God, forget it. And well, change, change, wonderful change is happening. Good, good stuff is happening. I mean, you mentioned a few of the shows. You've been on Law and & Order and, and Gotham and The World Turns and Oz, The Sopranos, you know, all these, uh, uh, and, and you're working, working, working. Yeah, it's, it's great. And another thing for, for the meet the biz folks, um, when people say, how do you continue to work all the time? And, and this, is, this is really the key. When I don't have a job that someone else gave me, I'm making my own work constantly. I am, uh, you know, if, if things seem to be not going, I haven't had a TV thing in a while, or I haven't had, or even a, a theater gig or something like that, I drum up some more performances if my solo shows anywhere anybody wants it. The minute I let them know, they go, yeah, we need you out here and out here and out here. And then I make work. So I keep working at this. And even where I'm a musical director at a, at a synagogue, which has been my in-between job for like 33 years, yeah. Village Temple. And every year I write the Purim Spiel, which is a, a parody of some show, yeah. uh, which my children's choir basically does the most performing in. And I rewrite Beauty and the Beast as Beauty in the East, <laughs> and Pocahontas as Pocahontas, <laughs> and Newsies became Jewsies, because uh, it's a Jewish thing. Yeah. I mean, Jews can do that. But, uh, but this year I did Hamilton, Esther of a Hamlet Town. <laughs> And uh, that had been my biggest challenge was people wanted me to do Hamilton. I said, no, 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 I love that show. Is, it's going to be too hard, but it happened. And, and the thing is that every year when I'm rewriting people's musicals, that's also this practice for my writing my own. When you try doing a Georgia O'Keeffe painting, you tr imitate her, like my daughter, when she was in school taking art classes, you imitate uh, a Van Gogh, you imitate a Picasso. It doesn't mean you're going to paint like that, paint mm. like that, but what it does is it gets your juices flowing and then you, you do it your own way. Right. And what I learned by rewriting all of these great shows, I, in Little Shop of Shushan, you know, all these things, I, I am cementing in myself the form of the show, the formula of how to create a theatrical, a theatrically satisfying event. So that helped me to write my second show. It was like, I never thought I would write a second show. I just thought, right. just write one show, you've made your contribution, that's great, you don't have to do that. But the second one wrote itself because it's like, Anita, you know how to do this, so yeah. write it. So put it down on paper and, and get it and memorize it and put it out there in public. Yeah. Well, wow. <laughs> I, uh, I'm so excited uh, right now because we get a, uh, we get a little show from uh, Anita Hollander. So I'm going to just turn it all over to you and we're going to sit back, enjoy this, um, this continued time with you. Thank so, you. There we go, there we go, and there she is, Anita Hollander. I am, I opened up the screen a little so you can see that I am actually at my piano. And because this is home piano, it, 
you'll notice that it's not in great tune. But I listened to all those famous people doing in-home things, and none of their pianos were tuned either. So there you go. Um, I would like to do two songs from Spectacular Falls, which is my latest solo show, which was premiered um, last September here in New York on 42nd Street. And, and then the third song I, um, is very special because it's a world premiere right now. This will be the first time I've performed this song for an audience. Um, it's a song I wrote for my 94-year-old aunt who is in an assisted living facility. And we, I talk to her and I sing with her every Sunday. And she, um, she's having a rough time with the whole solitude thing. So after I do the first two songs, you're going to hear something brand new. And I hope you enjoy it. Most people think a disabled bloke is so different from them, no joke. But it just takes a second, folks. You're just a banana peel away. A wise man tells me that he's okay. Got his limbs intact and all but hey. Things can happen most any day. It's just a banana peel away. You could choke at a hot dog stand. Great white shark could bite off your hand. Move into an old house thinking you'll restore her and turn out to be the amputeeville horror. Like that time on Fifth Avenue. Heading for the park and feeling groovy. Crutch fell into a manhole, truly just a banana peel away. Aced an audition for the music man. On the way out the door was jammed. Pushed and fell into a garbage can. You can't make this stuff up, folks. After a show, my fake leg propped up. Sipping champagne from a paper cup. Learn my lesson, I should never linger. Leg slipped off the chair and broke my finger. You can run, but you cannot hide. Might as well throw away your pride. Just lay back and enjoy the ride. You're just a banana peel away. Then that time I was on a date, had to go through turnstiles, great. I get stuck and for the hat trick, I find out that I can even do a backflip. Think I'm accident prone, it's true. Doesn't mean it won't apply to you. The element of surprise breaks through, you're just a banana peel away. While entertaining my baby girl, was so happy, did a little twirl. Broke my toe on my crotch mid-whirl, you're just a banana peel away. August day, sidewalk dry and hot. Slipped on plastic, someone dropped and forgot. In front of Ripley's, believe it or not, I did not believe it. Ah! You can fall, but it will be okay. Miracles happen every day. Just remember these words I say. You're just a banana peel away. I'm something you don't see every day. But you're a banana peel away. <laughs> so as I mentioned to David, yin yang.
good things and bad happen when you're a one-legged performer. And this is my statement about that. Now they're gonna tell you some things that you just don't want to hear. Like, oh, it's such a shame that you're so talented, my dear. That's the moment you remember just exactly who you are. For someone who's unhirable, you've gotten very far when you put yourself out on the line and tend to give your all. You take the risk that often you might slam into a wall. I've the body of a fighter who's constantly at war. I get knocked down a hundred times and rise a hundred more. When you're someone slightly different, people say things to beware. Like, why pursue a job where they don't want to have you there? There's a little piece of wisdom passed around from friend to friend. Says that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger in the end. There's a strength that's born of suffering that no doctor can reveal. When muscle pain and weakness comes from pills supposed to heal. Through all the weakness, although I don't feel strong, in spite of all the wreckage, I'm a fighter all allowing me to do that for you all. It's, I sang it for Judy Human a few weeks ago, uh, actually about a month ago, at a Jewish service where she was speaking. And I said, I would, and I was being the cantor that night and playing and singing. And I said, I would, if you don't mind, I would like to sing you this song. And she rolled over to me afterwards and the service was continuing, but she rolled over and she said, is there a recording of that? I need a recording of that. <laughs> and it made me so happy because if there was anyone who would understand that song more than me, it would be her. And it really was so much along the lines of what she talks about, about going to get a job and no, you can't be a teacher because some ridiculous answer. And I've just read her book, so. I am very proud of it. So thank you. And now, world premiere for my Aunt Nori. It's called Empty Parking Lots. Um. 
so much thank you thank you thank you anita hollander wow <laughs> that that last song really got to me because my uh, my uncle's in uh, a home right now so i was picturing him but it's uh beautiful what the songs that you write are amazing Thank you. Those were all her words. I just took the words we said in the conversation. And you know, because her family is saying, 
she's forgetting so much. She's forgetting so much. But she has a sense of humor, and she says, how old am I again? Mm. I'm 94. I'm 94. Who can remember anything? You know, and so it's, I'll remind her gently about what we talked about last week, but she goes, no, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when she's talking about, there actually is a piano in the hallway of this yeah. facility. And I said, can you not get them to just roll it into your apartment so that every day you can play because she's a choral ranger she's a she does sing-alongs with the whole the place when they allow you to go out of your room she'll sing and everybody gathers around and they all sing she arranges music i got all my harmony skills from her and my dad brother and, uh -huh. sister. and while her, her my cousins her son her daughters and son are like going oh, i don't know what we're gonna do with mom and i'm going but she's she just needs to get together with people and sing. So that's what we do. We sing Rodgers and Hammerstein every Sunday. And, uh, and I sang her this song. Right. I said, I, I hope you don't mind this song. And she loved it. Oh, God. Because I well, said, do you mind that I mentioned that you, you can't remember when you planned something that you forgot? And she goes, well, that's the truth. Yeah. So yeah, you should have that in there. Mm -hmm.